complete part of this. Um, I think it can be used to enhance existing social movements. Um, I'm not sure that it can be used by itself as um, a movement builder. Yeah, we saw with Howard Dean how it failed um, to mobilize votes, you know, in, in, the, in the primaries. And I think we've still got a lot of lessons to learn about how we translate all of this excitement and enthusiasm on the internet into local concrete action, especially when the demographics are so big. A lot of people pushing for change and you see immigration reform, the people showing up at the protests are very different set of people than a lot of us um, using the internet. So I think we've got some work to do to, to bridge internet activism and social change work happening on the web with the mass movements that happen in urban areas um, with migrant workers. We'll see. I think there's a lot of potential and I guess that's that's, that's what we can help. Um, America Speaks is a really interesting group. Um, we're sort of a hybrid organization that combines face-to-face um, -face dialogue with new tools for group collaboration and decision making. So what we do is we try to introduce very large-scale public processes into the public policy-making process in a way that mobilizes political support behind issues, in a way that perhaps it wouldn't be there unless it could see in a transparent way the degree to which the public is informed and engaged around that issue. So um, let's take a good example. New Orleans was the last place where we worked. And um, they had this very difficult planning process down there in which several plans had been put forward and had not gone anywhere. So uh, something called the Unified New Orleans Plan Process um, envisioned a series of citywide meetings that would then produce as the end result a plan that had both public support and broad political support necessary to move it forward and get people sort of working together on the same page. So we did a series of very large-scale town hall meetings, um, about 3,000, well, 2,000 in New Orleans itself, and then satellite forums in five cities because we really knew that one of the big challenges was going to be the pulling the voices of the displays. And so uh, we used a combination of um, internet video feed, um, teleconferencing, and whatnot with libraries as well as large civic venues in those other cities to, for an entire day, pull in roughly 3,000 citizens to sit down and say, what are our priorities for rebuilding New Orleans and how can we look at what some of the trade-offs and slide in those priorities might be. And as the end result, they actually just about a week ago, um, unanimously passed the Unified New Orleans plan. I think there's a lot of criticism of it. It's not quite specific enough to be a concrete roadmap. And yet it does lay out, I think, a basic framework um, that the city can work in. So that's a good thing. Um, we've got some challenges ourselves to figure out how do we keep all of these people who have been touched by a large-scale town meeting in touch with each other because in a way they are also becoming ambassadors for a new way of doing democracy, sort of a collaborative democracy. And so what we're trying to do and what we'd like to learn here is how can we use Web 2.0 skills, or tools, excuse me, to link um, these citizens across projects so we're not siloed. Oh yeah, I encountered a 21st century town meeting in New Orleans because we wanted to do X. Well, what if you could talk to the people in New York City who did that around the redevelopment of the World Trade Center? What if you could also connect with people who are excited around healthcare reform and we could start creating that bridge that we were talking about earlier between place-based organizing and larger grassroots movements for democratic movements. So that's what, that's, that's, that's what we do. And, uh, Kind of what I'm excited to, to learn about here. Brian Rose. Hello, my name is Brian Rowe. I'm with an organization called Freedom for IP. We look at how intellectual property rights interact with human rights. We believe that Web 2.0 really allows individuals to access content over a distributed environment, and if it's put under the right licensing or without restrictions, it allows diverse individuals from different socioeconomic backgrounds to access and interact with each other in a very new way. My name is Sarah Davies, I'm with Freedom for IP, and I think the web can be used for social change because um, people need access to information, and especially lower economic classes and people who aren't necessarily speaking English currently um, could use a lot of information about how to get by in our society. I also think that um, the Web 2.0 movement is bringing power to users and away from corporations, and I think that's very important for um, social change.
Hi, I'm Ruby Sinright with LotusMedia.org. Thrilled to be here. And um, I've been asked to talk about why the social why social media can be used for social change. Um, which to me, in some ways, it's it's almost inherently obvious, but I'd love to talk about it. Um, social media really represents the opportunity for individuals to speak, to guide institutions instead of institutions telling them what to do. So it is inherently democratic. Um, it can still be used in uh, uh, dictatorial ways that aren't democratic, um, but basically uh, by connecting people to each other, giving them the opportunity to share resources, build relationships, that's movement building work, and it's movements that create social change. My name is John Berger, I'm with a group called the Emancipation Network. We are trying to build a movement of modern abolitionists to help fight slavery and raise awareness about slavery today. And it's a movement that requires real people working on the ground, but they also have to communicate to each other and share ideas and the ability of the web to take the best of what some one person's local idea and one person's local connections and share that both in their community but throughout the world is what we're trying to achieve. And we think that uh, by helping build a, an abolitionist movement and social web to help uh, help identify people who care and share and help. I'm really here to learn about how we can partner with these organizations to help build a, a modern community of abolitionists uh, and help educate people about the problem of slavery today and how we can use the social web to take uh, people's skill and caring and interests and make a real world community of people who share things on the web but also work together in the real world to help end slavery. Uh, at X Squared. And my answer is that we're, we are looking for great projects that are built on and can build toward a new and higher form of social collaboration. And for this to happen, and happen at, at scale, will demand forms of social organization totally divorced from centralized control. So the next question becomes, what are we doing here as complementary tech soup? What's, what's the balance between doing what we've done so far and moving the locus of control fully into the community? Our friend Alan Gunn wrote some thoughtful words on, on his blog on the Net Squared site. And essentially, Gunner was, uh, was dubious about the competitive aspect of Net Squared and pointed out the dissonance between the competitive ethos and the collaborative ethos we're trying to support here. And I, I responded to, uh, on, on the versus into contact with new players. And basically, we think it's worthwhile to try to frame a different kind of discussion and to see how this net square goes in this kind of different framing and then go from there. I'll, I'll refer you to my introductory notes in the program for more heavy breathing and what it all means. But uh, basically, I just ask you to view these next few days as a point in time. Uh, an experiment, uh, a way to get different constituencies in contact with each other in a very goal-oriented way, and then we'll figure out how to improve it and go on from there. Let me take you to Rwanda, to a little place called Kitumba, where a village of Kutus and Tutsis try to make a living together. And there's a village in there called James, who found his way to the internet and posted the needs of that village on the Nabu site. The needs being that it's too dry, they need more water, and they need to irrigate better than they were doing. Through the Nambia site, James then got and the community got answers to those questions from various people. There were villages from Rwanda who told them about how they were doing that, so in the same country, but also from India and from Kenya, people came forward and said, this is how we do it. Then there were people from Holland and from Germany and from Australia telling how irrigation could be done differently with buckets and the drip system. That has been used now, and as a result, production is up in that little village in Rwanda. But the good thing, on top of the fact that there is now more water and better food production, is that, as James says, we now are in charge of our future. We have access to other people who answer questions, who help us plan, who open doors, who write for us, but who enlarge our problem-solving capability. That is what NABI does for them. So, I should explain to you that NABI means nature. <laughs>
N-A-B-U-U-R. Neighbor because we're all neighbors in the global village. And through the internet, we can actually interact, help each other as neighbors. So what is it? Is it a fundraising tool? I need to get this shirt button here. Is it a fundraising tool? I don't think so. It's much more about problem solving jointly than raising funds. There is some fundraising involved, but that's not the emphasis. So is it volunteer matching? Some of that too. But it's about jointly finding solutions to local problems, which is beyond that. You know, Navia combines the best of the old. That is a time-tested mechanism of neighborly help with the best of the new, that is the power of the 2.0 internet. And through that, it harnesses global knowledge to come up with local solutions to local problems. And in doing that, it helps break the dependency mode that many of these villages are in, and it empowers the local communities. Today, Nauru serves 140 communities, and about in Africa and Asia and Latin America, and about 9,000 volunteers have signed up as neighbors, as online volunteers, to make happen what I just described for this village in Rwanda. There's procedures in place, there's staff in place. Uh, we are supported by foundations in uh, Holland and Sweden. And there's some recognition beginning to show. Recognition from the UN. One of our volunteers was named UN Volunteer of the Year last year. Uh, recognition from, say, Google. Just yesterday, actually, we got a Google grant to use adverts for free for a couple of months. And recognition from Clinton, who invited me to his home in New York to talk about Nabu and to explain this to him. One of his questions was, why did you leave World Wildlife Fund, I used to be the CEO of World Wildlife Fund for many years, to work for this organization with a difficult name? And the answer is, there's only so much that institutions can do. Hierarchical institutions are limited, powerful as they are. We need to tap into other resources to actually make bigger things happen. Other resources being the power of the individual. So, yes, we do serve 140 communities now, but that number should go up to 10,000 quickly. And that can only be done through the help of you people. There's only one place in the world where that can happen, that's here in Silicon Valley. So you hear it in my voice, I am thrilled to be here and to ask your help to make us jump to the next level, to go from 140 communities to 10,000 communities quickly. Thank you so much for letting us move to the next level. Thank you very much. Online political action organization that has uh, worked to the goal of ending family violence in this country. Um, the beginning of Start Family Violence is, is kind of an exciting story. It's one of those one person makes a difference stories. I started Stop Family Violence seven years ago when I was chair of the board of a local domestic violence program in my hometown of upstate New York. And the director had come to me to tell me about the Violence Against Women Act federal legislation that was uh, going to expire by the end of the summer. It had been stuck on the back burner for 18 months. And she said, the board needs to raise some money. Well, I thought the board also needed to write a letter to the editor of the paper to tell people that this important legislation was, was going down the drain and to contact legislators. I got online at the one network co computer in our office uh, and, and looked to, to how, how to contact Congress. And I literally stumbled into the activist site. And the minute I saw it, I thought, that's what we need for the Violence Against Women Act. So I called up the company and found out how much it cost and kind of gulped, but thought it was worth it. And so I jumped in and built the Stop Family Violence website and sent an email off to my friends. Within a week, we'd sent a thousand messages to Congress. Within three weeks, the national organizations around the country were on board and they were sending their members we were sending a thousand messages today. And by the end of the summer, by the end of September, we had sent over 164,000 messages to Congress. I don't know how many phone calls were made. Survivors were calling to tell their stories of how violence had affected their lives. And Congress reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act for five years and $3.5 billion in funding for domestic violence and sexual assault services all around the country. So I learned seven years ago the power of the internet and, and how it can give power to one person's vision. It was actually about that time 
some of you probably recall that, that Microsoft had an ad campaign that was all about the power and the vision of the internet and asked, where do you want to go today? I thought to myself then, and I still think to myself today, that the answer for hundreds and thousands of women and children in this country every year is someplace safe. And yet, there is no one website online to find what the program locator for domestic violence and sexual assault, child abuse, and elder abuse services. There's no portal site. In fact, it's worse than that. Of the 3,500 domestic violence and sexual assault programs in this country, a third of them don't even have a website. Another third have sites that are really rudimentary. So part of what I want to do, of course, is to build that portal. Um, and that's not Web 2.0, that's Web 1.0, but it's where we need to start because it doesn't exist. We need to get these programs online. People who are most affected by um, intimate partner violence are age 16 to 24. That's the people who are most of the time on the web. They need a place to go. But beyond that, um, we, can, we can give different kind of power and tools to them now using Web 2.0 technologies to act as a, as a national organization that will feed information to these sites so that local programs don't have to be bothered um, maintaining websites when they're out saving lives. Similarly, when they have press releases about important events, we can push, push it back to the, the national portal so it can get more visibility. Um, we also do, of course, want to create social networks for victims, for survivors to be able to network with each other in much the same way that they're doing right now on Yahoo with Yahoo groups. It's brilliant, it's wonderful. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of groups on Yahoo and Microsoft groups, listservs, of, of survivors coming together and finding each other and sharing their struggles and their finding, and here's the exciting part, finding their collective power. And so that's the next place that I want to go. And this, I think, is the really innovative aspect of what I want to do, which is to take the same kind of activism tools that I found that gave me power and give them to all of the people who are doing social networking. And I ask that somebody please develop something that can be used open source that people can use to give power to their communities for civic participation so that there are other people out there like me who know how to make a difference, who will see the opening and will go for it if they have the tools to write petitions and to do surveys and to take polls and to send emails to, to people that they need to who can make change. So I thank you all and I hope that you'll support us in, in building a social network for social change.